I guess because of Haiti, the earthquake in 2010, they've decided to separate the countries of the Caribbean, and that's them there. And I pull them out, so you can see Barbados um, expected to lose uh, a maximum of less, or greater than 80%. Um, you see St. Lucia at 20, uh, Grenada and St. Vincent and uh, Dominica, we've done a lot of work in Grenada and Dominica, and theirs are up here and they've come down here. Um, Grenada lost about 86% of their houses um, significantly damaged or destroyed in Hurricane Ivan in 2004. But we are up here for both hurricanes and earthquakes. We are in the United Nations' worst category. It's not me. Is the United Nations, you can go on the United Nations website and download the report for yourself and read it. Probably maximum losses from a 1 in 250 year earthquake, and that is a moderate earthquake, and the hurricane in Barbados as a percentage of gross fixed capital formation, that's the buildings, the equipment and infrastructure that happened over that year, greater than 80%. The UN agrees with the Prime Minister, who inspected houses after tropical storm like Breeze Thomas and he had to confess, not to the priest, to the nation that he was flabbergasted at the fragility of the housing accommodation in Barbados. So I want to set this context very clearly because uh, a lot of damage that I saw in Haiti have been deployed there seven times and a lot of the damage cannot only be explained by bad construction practices. So to give you an idea of the development of Caribbean earthquake design standards, in 1985, the Caribbean Uniform Building Code was published, and then and I and many other engineers designed buildings according to that code. And then in the year 2000, the International Building Code was published, and that's supposed to be the base code for the Caribbean Building Code whenever it comes on screen. But we couldn't use it because we didn't have the, um, the values, we didn't have them. But the University of West Indies came up with the values in 2013, sorry, 2003. They came up with the seismic parameters so that we could now use it, and we did. I did, and many engineers did, and um, designed buildings all over the Caribbean. And then in the year 2011, uh, the University of West Indies' Seismic Research Center published updated peer-reviewed seismic parameters. So that's the old map, there's Barbados there, and uh, these are the new maps. And when these came out in 2003, there was a big fanfare and they came to our engineer conferences and said, ah, you can start using these, and uh, we did. These came in very, let me use my words carefully, uh, stealthily. Uh, they sneaked them in, no fanfare, up to last year, after last month, because the college, engineers send their calculations to the college, we review them and say yes, they're good or no, you've got to upgrade them a bit more. And um, up to last month, engineers are still using these old values. So these are from the University of Western Seismic Seism Seism Research Unit, and they changed their name to the Seismic Research Center, and we came up with these peer-reviewed ones. Now, why is this important? Because engineers want to know what is this base shear? Because the base shear is what we design, um, it is our earthquake forces. Um, and it's a percentage of the weight of the building. It's very important because, as you see, we need to know what that base shear is because it shackles out the bottom. So we need to design the, the, at least the bottom and going up for this base shear um, so that the building doesn't collapse. And as I said, it's a percentage of the weight. So anyone can calculate this weight. Primary school students can calculate the weight. Is this the weight of the beams and columns and slabs and fixed furniture? Um, so for essential building, I did some calculations for a three-story building on rock. For essential buildings like hospitals and police stations, uh, it came up to 8% if you use cubic. Before cubic, there used to be a rule of thumb, use 10%. 10%, 10 you're safe. Um, and then the seismic research unit said, ah, use too much steel, use five. 
They didn't actually say five, they gave parameters and you do the calculations, it comes up to 5%. But the, what we should be using, which is the peer-reviewed stuff, is 22%. We should be using 22%. And if it's public buildings, then it comes up to 6% if you're using cubic, 4% if you're using the old values. And then what we should be using is 18%. So a rough rule of thumb should really be 25%, a quarter of the weight of the building. So, engineers, we design for the maximum considered earthquake, and that's expected to result in substantial damage uh, and costly damage to the structure, but the building should not collapse. It's analogous to a major car collision. The car absorbs the energy, but the people survive. The car absorbs the energy, but the people survive. So, I went to Haiti, and that's pretty much the closest I can find to what we design. We design it so that this happens. When we design for earthquakes, we expect this to happen. The building is damaged beyond repair, but the people can escape safely. So this is where we should be. And we're not even close to this. We designed all the way down here. Um, so myself as well. On behalf of engineers around the Caribbean, I am sorry. I am very sorry. I used to say, if there's a hurricane, why you go into your house? Why you leave your building that the engineers designed and go into your house that they didn't design? Stay in your commercial building. Stay in the building. Um, don't leave and go home to you know, your, your less than, than strong building. But no, I can't say that for earthquakes. I can't say that at all. So, this is Haiti, um, and the people are still under there. This is the, so the base here would have impacted here, but we have this grill, this gate, and that stiffened this, and therefore this was the next week, this is the weaker link, and therefore it dropped, and the people are still under there. The yeah, people are still under there. There's a school, and the skulls were all crushed. Because they're just children. This, we need to use strong materials. So if you have a load applied to a frame, flexible materials like wood, they will bend. Brittle materials like concrete will break. And therefore, we want to reduce the amount of deformation. We don't want this to happen. So we select strong materials. Even if you have strong materials, if you don't connect them properly, they separate during high winds. Even if you have strong materials, when the wind comes, if the connections aren't strong, if the connections aren't strong, they blow away. So we want to make sure you have a roof sheeting. 0.5 millimeters is the minimum. 0.5 millimeters is the minimum thickness for roof sheeting. And that's connected to your purlins or your battens. And that's connected to your rafters with these purlin um, clips. And that's connected to your ring beam, the stainless steel truss anchors. And that's connected to your wall with rebar. And that's connected to your foundation with rebar. And then that's connected to the ground. That is a 0.3 millimeter thick roof sheeting. Grenada 2004, Hurricane Ivan. It tears. Even though this is at 6 inch centers, which is the recommended spacing, 6 inch, six inch centers between fixings, because it's so thin, it tears. 0 0.5 millimeters is the minimum you should use. So once the roof is gone, because the connections are weak, once the roof is gone, everything in the house is gone. <coughs> if you put your passport in a nice plastic and hid it away somewhere, those winds will take it away. Um, so everything goes, <coughs> Haiti was a, a sorry, this Grenada was a, a real heartbreaking experience. I've never seen that kind of misery before. Uh, when people are hungry, they do all kind of crazy things. Um, poor fella, you know, this lady here, couldn't even move. Because if she moves, someone comes and steals your stuff. Um, everything's gone. And the things that are there belong to people that are way over there. And the things that are here are somewhere in the sea. So you can't say, this is mine. Right, so even the government offices are gone. Um, so government records will be lost. 
I hope you paid your solid waste tax. <laughs> if you did not, you may have to pay it again if you do not have your receipt. Because even though the government's records may be gone, you're guilty of the proven innocent, and you're proven innocent with the receipt showing that you paid it. So, the third concept is you may have strong materials and you may have strong connections, but if it's not braced, it can collapse. Strong materials, that's good. Strong connections, that's good. But if you don't have uh, a well-braced structure, it can also collapse. So, you have some cross-bracing internally. That's one way of bracing a structure. Or externally, you can brace the structure that way. Or the corner bracing, you do that with timber, hull, timber frames. Mm -hmm. Or you fix the base. And the most economical method for bracing a house is to use shear walls. So, inadequate shear walls is usually the main problem, the main problem that we have around the Caribbean. Inadequate shear walls. This is really a design error. The error is made by architects and draftsmen. Generally. <laughs> so. so here is a house from the old Barbados Building Code. So you come inside, and that's your living and dining room, and you walk across to your kitchen, you walk across to your laundry area, and you have your first bedroom, you come across to your second bedroom, and that's the bathroom shared by these two bedrooms, <coughs> or you can come into your master bedroom, which are ensuite, has an ensuite bathroom. About 900 square feet, comfortable house, three bedroom, two bath, and if you want, you can take down this wall, and you have the open concept. So we had, you know, for over two decades, um, house designs, comfortable house designs, 900 square feet. Um, but they also had shear panels. Shear panels. And these shear panels or shear walls, they must be 10 feet long. 10 feet long to resist the shaking in this direction. And in this direction, 10 feet long or 10 feet long. And if you can't get 10 feet because of the geometry, because there are windows or doors in the way, you're allowed to have two, six and a half feet um, shear walls. You have that, it should survive. You should live, and your children. So that's it there, the shear panels. It's just like any other wall, you just need 10 feet. Or if you can't get 10 feet, have two, six and a half feet. That's it. Simple. It costs nothing to do. You just rub <coughs> the line on the paper and have your shear wall. It costs the contractor no additional money, it costs the designer no additional money, it costs the homeowner no additional money, it costs no one no additional money. It's free. But you can look in vain over the past 20 years for a house in Barbados with shear walls. You may find four. Of all the thousands that have been built, you may find four that have shear walls. Why? Uh, here's a fellow now. He could have had a shear wall, but he didn't. Why? because he decided to build a room for his car. It's a strange thing that we do to <laughs> another Caribbean. We build rooms for our cars. Uh, so you say, where's the dog? He's outside. So you have the dog, who do we love, and love, who loves you, he's outside, and you, <laughs> and you rain, and the car is in the house. <laughs> put the car in the house, we put the car in the house for? Oh, well, I don't want to get wet. No, no. The way you park it at work, it gets wet. No, oh, you don't want the sun to go on it. Well, the sun shines on it when you're at work, when you have it in the car park. Oh, I don't want the moon. The moon like to shine on it. It's ridiculous. You know, you need an excuse. Virgins why, why, do we put, why do we build a separate room in our house for a car? No, it's okay. If you have all the money to do it, go ahead and do it. If you have the money to do it, go ahead and do it. But don't complain about you don't have enough space and, and putting the car in the house. So why do we do this? Oh, we follow the Americans. They have their cars and their houses. Why? Because they have snow. It's cold. I mean, it's freezing. You can't start the car. So they need to put their car, their cars, in their houses. That's what they do. They build rooms in their house for their cars. Have you decided to do the same thing? I said, you want to do it? No problem. You know. And if the wife says do it, you must do it. I have to do it myself. <laughs> You don't need to do it. You don't need to do it. Um, but there's a ship. Park. <laughs> Assistance. Ah, oh, here we go. But there's a shear wall. So you made the house unsafe by doing this. 
Well, boy, if you live in something like this, <laughs> if you live in something like this, do not leave here unless you know the Lord. Do not leave here. Do not leave here. The, earth, the earthquake can come at any time. Right? It's not like the, earth, the hurricane, they have some warning. The earthquake shakes and that's it. This, you don't know how this can survive. You don't build columns with block work. You do not build columns with block work. You build it out of reinforced concrete. But this, this is one of the horror things. This PG, this, this R18. <laughs> um, so this here, this is a lot more <coughs> braced than that. And that didn't survive. Right? Need, neither did that. Or that. Or that. How do you expect, you know, these... No, you can do something with that. You can just block it up, block up that, and therefore you've, on both sides, and then block up that and the other one on both sides, and you've, you've, um, you've made it stable. But as it is right now, that is horrific.